Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gordon Scott, Head of Investments and Client Solutions here at Brown Shipley. Welcome to this latest edition of Counterpoint Live, where we focus on our outlook for 2023. I'm joined by Daniele Antonucci, our Chief Economist and Macro Strategist, and Sarik Bourbon, Head of Portfolio Strategy. Over the next 30 minutes or so, leaving us time for your questions, which you can submit on the chat anytime, we will set out our views on what is happening across the globe, our asset allocation to reflect the risk and opportunity that we see, and crucially, how that will translate to the portfolios that you trust us to manage on your behalf. Now, on that point of trust, just very briefly, we take very seriously our responsibility to manage your investments. 2022 has been a painful year. The coming together of post-COVID supply and demand friction and the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has driven breakneck inflation and interest rates rising much higher and much more quickly than anticipated. The downward pressure on bond and equity prices generally, alongside being honest, some positioning within our portfolios has driven very meaningful negative returns. We all know that investing successfully requires a longer term view. That will always be the, be the case. However, I want you to know that the financial and emotional impact of such drawdowns is real and is not lost on me or my team. I hope that the ongoing service, advice and guidance from your client advisor during this period has helped you to consider what it all means to you and to your strategy. And whilst today we will deliberately focus on our overarching investment views, and outlook, we are here on an individual basis to make sense of it with your circumstances in mind and to continue, I hope, to earn the trust that you place in us. So on that, let me now hand over to Daniele to start us, start us off with our headline views as we see things today. Daniele. Thank you, Gordon, and good everyone here on the call. Good afternoon. Let me just give you the big picture and our key talking points, then we will pull some charts to go through some of these aspects. I'll start with the economy, then we'll talk about financial markets as well. The economy next year is likely to be characterized by three important shifts. There's the new cycle that is likely to start from the second quarter or so from the spring, while the first few months will probably look like pretty much the end of this year. But from the second quarter, the first shift that we see is the peak in inflation. The past the peak move accelerates. There's a lot of signs in the US, and we think that over time that will become more evident in the UK and in the Euro area, where so far we haven't been seeing more, many signs of inflation deceleration. To be clear, we think inflation will stay elevated, just less so than this year. Then the second shift is the pivot to the dovish side, which means that we think that the US Federal Reserve, the central bank, but also the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, we think they will no longer hike rates from the second quarter or so. They will pause, they will stop, but we don't see rate cuts. And the third shift is the pickup in China growth. China is where the UK was a couple of years ago under lockdown. Now they're trying to reopen. We think they will, and at that point, stimulus will filter through. Demand will uh, accelerate, and so they will rebound, though moderately. So what it means for markets, uh, what it means is that, you know, look, bond deals finally do what they are supposed to do. Bond markets now look more attractive. They can offer protection. We like, we prefer, we have increased as exposure to high quality um, bond markets in the UK, in Europe, as interest rates peak, growth slows and inflation eases. And then the next issue to drop is low quality bond markets. Interest rate differentials versus safe bonds are tight. They are not very wide. And so we have reduced our exposure to low quality bond markets. Now we have a slightly different currency view. You'll have seen strong dollar appreciation over the course of 2022. Of course, in the UK, because of the change in government, the change in fiscal policy, sterling has started to recover. We think this will continue moderately. Sterling will likely move sideways for some time, then continue to recover a little bit versus the dollar. And just a word on equities. 
we are positioned in, in this way. We like the US and should we see a rebound in US stocks because maybe interest rate fall more rapidly than expected, we are well positioned to capture that. We like emerging market equities because they already acceleration that we expect and they are attractively valued. And if China reopens more decisively, we are well positioned to capture that. We think markets don't downward pressure on euro area equities. We think there's going to be an earning recession there. We don't think markets reflect that. And so we have reduced our exposure to euro area equities. And we think there are buying opportunities when it comes to equities that offer attractive dividends, high dividends, persistent dividends, and also equities that show low volatility. This diversify in a defensive way our equity exposure. Now I want to show you maybe just a couple of, of charts to highlight some of these points. So the next slide illustrates what we think about economic growth. As the title says, it probably gets worse before it gets better. And this is to say that, look, outlook don't describe really what, what happens um, uh, from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. Of course, things don't work that, like that in, in the real world. At the start of the year, it's pretty much chart shows, this green line shows that the economy continues to deteriorate. Eventually, the West enters recession, all of it, the UK, the Euro area, and more mildly, also the US. But what keeps us out of global recession is China. China is doing the opposite of what the West is doing. The West is raising interest rates. China is cutting interest rates. The West is slowing. China looks set to rebound. And so eventually, things pick up, and also less interest rate pressure meaning no more rate hikes in the West help too. So this is our underlying assumption. It's almost a year or two halves so until the spring, things remain challenging in terms of economic activity. But, but from the spring, the summer and onwards, things begin to recover, albeit moderately. Very important for inflation, which is what you see in the next slide. So the slide there, um, if you look at, at inflation, that slide shows a moderation in inflation on the left-hand side. And if we could go to the next picture, please. So the next slide shows that in the US, inflation is beginning to moderate more visibly. Signs are everywhere. Durable goods inflation is slowing significantly now. Delivery times are now shorter. Input prices are no longer rising. And that should make sense. Supply chains, although still far from normal, uh, they uh, normalize to some degree. Commodity price pressure is less so. Of course, it's a slow moderation because not all is normalizing just yet. You see on the right hand side, certain things haven't adjusted, but there is a, an underlying correction in the housing market in the US, which should slow the component of inflation that haven't decelerated just yet. Again, they have to do with housing, with rent inflation, services inflation more generally. We haven't seen signs of this just yet in the UK or elsewhere, elsewhere in the Western world, but we think that over time, similar pressures driven by economic weakness and the weakness is driven in turn by interest rate hikes, we think that this will show up also outside of the US, in the UK, and in the Euro area. And again, inflation stays elevated, but moderates less so than this year. That's very important for interest rates. And so the next slide, this one shows that we think rates are close to peaking. On in the UK, we are at 3%. If you look at the base rate, that's the bank rate. It's the yellow line there. Euro area monetary policy is, hasn't tightened that much. The US is ahead of the UK. On the other hand, we think we are close to the peak. We'll probably see a few more rate hikes in the first few months of 2023, and also next week for that matter, when we have a range of central bank decisions, including the Bank of England. But then as the recession sets in, we should see a pause. Central banks should not hike anymore. Of course, that doesn't mean that financing conditions get very easy, very accommodative. Central banks on the right-hand side, you see, have bought a lot of government bonds and also corporate bonds. And when they did that, bond deals were very low. There was downward pressure on bond deals. Now this is beginning to change. Central banks no longer buy this. The Bank of England is actually selling 
uh, bonds. And so this is why we think that bond deals will decline, although not very sharply, not in one go. The main message here, though, is that rates are close to peaking. This has a lot of implications. The next slide shows one key implication. This is about currencies. 2022 has really shown a lot of dollar strength. Now we are saying that sterling will likely recover, the euro will likely recover as well, but we expect this to happen slowly. Why? Because the main driver of currencies is the interest rate differential. And until now, US interest rates have been rising much more uh, and, uh, rapidly compared to the UK or the euro area. That's why the dollar was strong. Now, central banks are moving more or less in sync. They should all pause or stop at around the same time between the first and the second quarter of next year. And that's why I think that the dollar is not strengthening anymore. It's weakening moderately, but not significantly. This is a trend that we expect to continue. A slight sterling recovery, but not very much. Now, this is what the chart illustrates. You can see that, for example, in, in 2019 or in 2020, when the Federal Reserve stopped hiking interest rates and started to move sideways, it kept interest rates at a high level, but no longer hiking, the dollar didn't weaken immediately. All right, it took some time. Eventually, it did depreciate slightly until the central bank hiked interest rates again to combat inflation. So this is the, the dynamic that we expect. What I've circled in this chart is precisely the type of dynamic that we are likely to see next year. In in our view, where sterling moves initially sideways, maintains its value versus the dollar, but then recovers a little bit more, and probably even more in 2024, even though we are a long way away from that. Now, moving on, if you look at the next slide, so this one I think is important as well, and it's a summary of our tactical positioning. This is how we are positioned. Siric will go through this in more detail, but just to give you a glimpse of how things have changed. The dials at the top show our government bond exposure. We had reduced the lesser exposure relative to normal or to our long-term allocation in government bonds. Now we have increased that. Within government bonds, yields, US treasuries, they now offer protection. That's why we have increased that. Credit, you see, we were overweight credit in the sense that we had an increased exposure versus normal in credit in corporate bonds. Now we are more back to neutral to normal, but this conceals or masks two very important shifts. We raise our exposure to high quality corporate bonds, investment grade bonds. We like this in the UK, in the Euro area as well. We think they are attractive and we have reduced our exposure to low quality corporate bonds, high yield corporate bonds. We think they don't reflect enough deterioration in economic activity, not as much as we expect. Equities, as you can see, we have a slight defensive exposure. We have somewhat less equities than normal versus our long-term allocation. But this one too, as we said at the beginning, um, um, it's just uh, the, uh, the mix or the, the sum of our very different uh, preferences. We still prefer the US market versus the euro area market in equities. We think that earnings, even though in the US too, they are likely to deteriorate, are likely to deteriorate less than in the eurozone. And we like emerging market equities because we think they are attractively valued and already discount the economic deterioration we expect. Finally, because of our change in the dollar call, we now no longer expect a strong US dollar. We have reduced our exposure to US dollar cash back to neutral. Now, just a few words on this, and then I'll hand it over to Sirik. The next slide. So this one, I think, um, shows how we approach things. We are students of history. We look at many economic cycles, many market cycles, and we try to gauge what's similar, what's different this time around. So this chart shows two, two points of the yield curve, or two points um, um, when you look at the interest rate curve, the 10-year point on the left and the two-year point on the right. Now it shows what happens to bond yields before and after inflation. The green line is where we are. It shows that it's really a exceptional 
uh, if you look at 2022. Normally, after peak inflation, three, six, 12 months down the road, interest rates, bond yields are lower, not higher. This happens especially for short-term interest rates, but happens more generally. Why? Because normally you have a peak in inflation and decline in inflation if there is economic weakness, if there is a recession. And so markets price central banks to eventually stop interest rate hikes and cut rates later on. That's what we are likely to see, not in one go, but over time. So if you look at fixed income, we're talking about lower bond yields post peak inflation. And my final slide, the next one. So this one shows that markets are beginning to price this. So what this slide shows is what traders, so people putting their money where their mouth is, they do what they say, what traders expect and how they are positioned. You see that the gray line at the bottom shows that actually markets didn't expect that many rate hikes as Gordon mentioned early in 2022. Uh, but now that's the orange line Markets price a lot of rate hikes, but eventually late next year and the beginning of the interest rate reduction of the interest rate cutting cycle. We don't expect that, actually. We think simply the central banks will pause, will stop. But this is to say that this is the reason why bond deals are no longer rising. They're very well behaved. They're moving sideways to marginally lower. Markets are pricing the whole of the, the hiking cycle. And this is a very important input uh, for our fixed income calls. And I'll stop here now and hand it over to Sirik for our investment recommendation. Thank you, Daniele. Um, before we go into the detail of some of the positions you've touched on, I think as you highlighted earlier, you know, as we end one year and start another, you know, obviously we're not talking about making wholesale changes to our portfolios, wholesale changes to you know the key pillars of our process and our convictions. You know, we, there will be positions that we maintain and we're going to 2023, a position that might be there for many convictions in these and is an annual touch. Uh, so here we're focusing on some of the near term changes uh, we are making to portfolios as we effectively position them in line with our views that Daniel just mentioned. So a world that remains uncertain where there are some assets we've got higher convictions in and we wanted to increase our exposure to these and where some asset classes are in our view more vulnerable with potentially more downside then we've wanted to reduce these and we've started implementing them in portfolios this week so high quality fixed income so what does that mean generally buying more government bonds, as Daniel mentioned, both in the US and in the UK, and reducing some of the exposure we perceive as being a little bit riskier in the near term, including high yield in the US and also investment grade in the US. So both these asset classes we have reduced slightly by about five, six, five to six percent across the portfolios. And we have instead allocated this money to UK gilts and also the US treasuries. We've also increased the exposure to UK corporate bonds in particular for our sterling portfolios. Uh, why? Because we believe they're also of higher quality and both the compensation for owning them and also the quality of the markets being in terms of credit rating higher than in the US also more diversified in terms of sector exposures. Those are characteristics that we think are good to have in the near term in our portfolios, alongside some of our existing positions that we maintain. So if we move to the next slide, I hand over to Daniele to, uh, to go through some of the equity uh, changes. Okay, sure, it's very, very simple. So when we were preparing this outlook, we asked ourselves um, whether given the correction we've seen in markets, equities came down quite a bit in the course of 2022, we asked ourselves whether equities are attractively valued. And generally speaking, the answer is no. There are ex exceptions to that. I mentioned, for example, US equities, are the largest, most liquid equity market 
This is what this chart shows. This shows an equity valuation model. Effectively, you can see the green line equities were becoming cheaper uh, the more the price went down. But then we got sort of the recent rally, a partial recovery in equities, and they still look expensive. This valuation measure essentially shows what is the compensation for you for owning. adjusted for inflation. Equity is a real asset. It's your participation is a share in the future growth of a firm, of a company. And so you compare that, what is the difference? What is the compensation that you need over and above of safe bonds adjusted for inflation? This is why we haven't modified our overall equity allocation, but we thought that within equities, we want to look for exposures that diversify away from quality growth and add for example, equities that deliver a persistent dividend, equities showing low volatility. Now, the next slide. So this one, I think, is really important as well uh, for our cause. You have seen a similar chart for, for bond yields. It shows the same thing, why we haven't really risked our portfolios just yet. Just so we're clear, this is not the time to de-risk either. But at the same time, we consider whether we wanted to re-risk. And this shows what happens to equities after inflation peaks, three or six months down the road or 12 months. The green line is where we are. It's really following the historical pattern. And of course, there are differences depending on whether there's a recession or there isn't one. But normally, if you think that there is a recession, six to nine months down the road, equities are roughly flat. They deliver zero in terms of, of return. And that's why we didn't uh, re-risk. Uh, there's also a high dispersion. This is the, 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 the shadow, the gray shadow, the area around that. Of course, equities are, are volatile assets. And we have seen historically that when you are at around inflation peak and inflation begins to moderate, there are some instances where equities rebound strongly, but there are also some instances where equities continue to deteriorate, where the bear market extends. And again, this is why we think we are um, comfortable with our equity al um, allocation. We like the US over the euro area. That's a, um, a radical, it's a preference of the US over the euro area. Uh, we like equities that already discount the adjustment that we believe. But like before, there are many more details. And, and so again, I want to hand it over to Sirik to cover some of these finer points. Thank you, Daniele. So what are we doing in terms of changes uh, to portfolios on the equity side. So we're adding, as Daniele hinted at, we're adding some, some new exposures uh, to the portfolios, which we believe will add something different compared to some of the existing biases we have in the portfolio. So one of the key characteristics of our approach within equities is that it's focused mostly on quality investments. And I will touch on that a little bit later. But with the addition of those two specific themes you're seeing here, high dividend and low volatility equities, we're adding something different. We're adding different sector exposures. So high dividends, they're actually sustainable dividend companies that have sustained and grown their dividend every year for the last 20 years in the US. And this can be found across, across many sectors. Um, in particular, obviously segments where there is more defensiveness, more steady revenue streams, such as consumer staples, utilities, uh, industrials too, uh, much less so in areas like technology where the dividends obviously are not generally the focus on management in terms of those businesses. We already have technology in quite a few of our investments in the rest of our portfolio, so we're comfortable to be adding a different type of exposure with this instrument. Similarly, the low volatility exposure in more in practice, what that means is this is a fund that looks to be exposed to companies that are not very volatile by nature in terms of their business or their share prices. If we look at the underlying exposures we get at the sector level within this low volatility index, basically, we do get exposure to some sectors like healthcare, uh, also consumer staples, uh, and also some of the industrials. And there is also some tech exposure because some, some tech companies can be quite resilient, quite defensive in terms of the key characteristics that their businesses have. 
They tend to have higher margins that tend to give them a good cushion for when economic activity slows down. They tend to be well managed, they are high quality, and the markets tend to value these trades. So this index is also exposed to some of these names. If we move to the next slide, we, we can then uh, see that we do not change everything in the portfolios. So the addition of uh, low volatility and dividends are of about three to four percent, depending on the uh, risk profiles. The aggregate equity exposure, which ranges from 20% in low risk portfolios to about 100% in high risk portfolios, is still dominated by a lot of the other instruments that we hold, which are not changing, be they third party funds that we use, active funds or passive funds, and also some of our in-house single line equity exposure that we continue to maintain. But here we just maintain the key views we have in terms of liking a market like the US. Why do we still like the US? The US is both an economy and a market in terms of construct and drivers that remains more resilient. Not just in terms of the economy, but also the characteristics of the companies within the US, thinking about their exposure to several drivers, several sectors, which tend to be generally more defensive, more resilient in terms of fundamentals, in terms of profits. The volatility of profits, the volatility of profit margins in the US is lower than it is in all the major regions in the world. And this is one of the main reasons why we continue to have exposure and maintain this for the next six to 12 months in the short term. We stay away from Eurozone equities, as you can see on the right hand side. This is an area which we believe the market is too positive on, especially if you judge by the share price performance of Eurozone stocks in the last couple of months. But we believe the earnings expectations, the profit expectations the market is assigning to European stocks for the next 12 months are unrealistic. Whereas in, for instance, emerging markets or US equities, we've started to see significant downgrades to those profit expectations, especially in emerging market equities, which is a position we continue to maintain with a preference, with an overweight position for the next six to 12 months on a tactical basis. If we move to the next slide, and for, for the next three or four slides, I really want to give you a bit more context surrounding the key pillars, some of the key characteristics of our portfolios at Brown Shipley. We've touched on so far a lot of the changes we're making given our near term views. As Daniele mentioned, we're looking to smooth the journey in the near term, adapt portfolios by changing sometimes, you know, 10 to 15, 20 percent of the portfolios to make the portfolios better suited for the prevailing environment. However, the bulk of the portfolios remain invested for the long term, aligned with our key pillars. The first one here is quality. Quintet portfolios are exposed to quality investments. We believe quality wins in the long term. Granted, like in 2022, it won't happen every year. Not you know, every investment style does not work each year. So we have to also accept some level of volatility when we apply conviction in our approach. What do we mean by quality? So quality, as you can see in the top left here, there are six characteristics we typically look for, or we look at least for a combination of these in our equity investments. We look for strong brands, products that are really critical that consumers want to buy, that governments, regulators are pushing. We want companies that are good at allocating capital that reinvest their profits to generate new avenues for growth, to build new products, to innovate. We want companies that have pricing power, generally high margins, and they are key characteristics that we have in the portion of our portfolios. About 10 to 20 percent is invested in equities in our single line in-house global portfolio. And these characteristics do remain true today, despite what has been a challenging year for performance in quality, quality growth stocks that we hold. The fundamentals of these companies remain really strong. Yes, the market in the short term has derated uh, some of the share prices of these names because these names tend to have what we call longer duration growth, long term growth prospects. And when there is uncertainty in the near term and when interest rates go up, the market tends to put a bit more uncertainty towards some of those investments. But we believe as the fundamentals come through in these companies, as their products continue to be adopted, their share prices will recover and will outperform. We don't know when this will happen, but history shows it has happened over time. 
If we move to the next slide, we show another pillar of our portfolios, which is that we are trying to do it obviously gradually and more and more, trying to invest responsibly and sustainably. This is really about backing businesses that are either the, the best in their segments in terms of uh, sustainable characteristics. What does sustainable mean? Because sustainable means something to me, which is different from what it means to you. It, we all have our different thresholds of sustainability. So we're trying to broadly invest in a, in a broad way, according to, to some key principles. The first one is we want to obviously back the asset classes where there is evidence that doing things well adds value, both from a return standpoint and also from a risk standpoint. By doing the right things as a company, you're naturally going to be less exposed, less vulnerable to controversies. This is what we mean by reducing risk. You also are exposed by trying to do the right things. You're also exposed to areas of the market that our governments, our regulators and consumers want to buy because they are better products. So naturally your revenues will be supported by that. And in the long run, there's evidence, as you can see on the bottom left chart, which looks at the last 15 years of a sustainable equity index compared to say the broad conventional global equity market, that sustainable approach does not detract. Here, we've been fortunate in the last 15 years, even though in our portfolios, it's really been reflected in the last couple of years, but it has added value. In the long term, our belief is as most segments of the market become sustainable, this will become the norm for most investors. And all the studies show that actually, especially the young generations that's coming through now, in their early 20s, they are very much in favor of doing the right things. So we want to be part of that journey and we've gradually positioned portfolios towards these investments and we continue to do so. The final point that I want to make, which is very structural and really key to our belief in investing globally. On the next slide, you can see that we want to be exposed to longer term trends in our portfolios. We want to capitalize on this. These longer term trends, we simplify on the right hand side, you know, they basically are affecting people, the planet and productivity. There are significant forces that are at play in our world, probably for the next 10 to 20 years, maybe the biggest conjunction, the confluence of forces happening across many segments of the market, market which will change our lives. We simplify them in terms of those key themes, productivity, people and planet. In practice, what do they mean? They are related to technological progress, innovation. They are related to change that is happening in our societies from a social standpoint, demographic standpoints. We're having to adapt with new technologies that are impacting our daily lives and companies in that space will benefit greatly, whether that is with the energy revolution, the transportation revolution, the advance of electrification, etc. The change our economies will go through to be more efficient, to be less polluting too. And consumers are pushing this change. It is not just the regulators. We are seeing it in our consumer behaviors. So we're exposed to digital segments, as we call on the bottom left here, digital enterprise, exposure to the cloud, cybersecurity, via some of the companies we hold in the portfolios via our funds, but also via some specific single line exposures we have. The digital consumer, the advance of health, we have quite a bit of healthcare exposure in portfolios, as, as I will show you in the next slide. And we also have exposure to um, uh, automation, you know, the, the advance of uh, robotics, there is a lot of progress being made across segments. This is not just about looking at the technology sector. This impacts the healthcare sector, the, the, the media sector. This expects financials. This expects all industries, industrials, auto companies are now becoming more tech companies. A massive change compared to even what we saw 10 years ago. And we believe we're at that point where these innovations are starting to come through. Yes, with the uncertainty in the near term on the macro front, they might be slowed down a bit in the last six to 12 months, but they are at a point in their cycle where they are very competitive price wise. Consumers are adopting them, companies should benefit and grow as a result. So we have exposure to that in the order of about 40% of equity exposures across portfolios are exposed to those long term trends. When we look at the underlying underneath the bonnet at all the stocks that are held. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a bit of an insight into 
a balance of our shorter term changes we made to the portfolios, 10 to 15 percent to reflect the nature of the environment that is uncertain, that does remain uncertain, whilst not compromising the long term performance and indeed recovery potential we see in our portfolios. And hopefully the last few slides show you some of our key pillars while we maintain our conviction. This slide 20 is just to wrap up to show you a bit of a picture of what an example balanced portfolio looks like at Brown Chipley. You have in the middle the asset allocation exposure, a, a balanced portfolio, broadly speaking, through time will have about 60, 65 percent in equities. We're currently at 62 percent, a little bit below because of our more cautious views, as Daniel mentioned earlier, for the next few months. The bond exposure, 32 percent, is broadly, is more diversified, is now higher quality. On the left hand side, you can see some of the look through exposure, which I briefly touched on. You can see the sector exposure. It's quite broad. The top three sectors, we do have some technology, some financials, some healthcare. If you look underneath the bonnet at the actual stocks, you can see the top 15 equity holdings. When we look at the aggregate balance portfolio, you can see here, and you can see here a breadth of good quality companies. We do have a large cap portfolio. I think this is important at this point in time after a difficult year for markets and probably heading into maybe some more uncertainty. We are sitting with companies with quality, good balance sheets that don't need cash to basically stand through or to live through the uncertainty potentially in the next few years. So a quality buy is really important. We're sitting here with good companies. So I will stop here and hand back over to Gordon uh, so we can take uh, questions. Thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Sarik. So the, the chat is open, ladies and gents, for, for questions. Some have been coming through um, while, while Daniele and uh, Sarik have been speaking, but there's hopefully some uh, some opportunity for you still to submit some of your own questions. So back to the macro and interest rate position. Daniele, you said that we we're probably reaching the, the peak closer to home. What, What's your, your view, what's your call for the Bank of England in the coming week and where do you think UK interest rates will ultimately peak? OK, sure. Thank you, Gordon. Yes, next week we have all major central banks reporting on their interest rate decisions. The Bank of England is one of them. We expect the first step in slowing the pace of rate hikes. We think the Bank of England will hike by um, half a percent to three and a half percent from three Currently, this is a slower pace of increase than in the previous decision when they hiked rates by three quarters of a percent. Very, very important. The dovish pivot, so the stopping of the rate hiking cycle doesn't happen in one go. First, the bank slows the pace of hikes and then eventually they stop. This is the first step next week. We expect the bank to continue to raise rates moderately to four and a quarter, four and a half percent in the first quarter of next year, and that we think it's going to be the peak. And following on from that, what's what's your view? What's your view in sterling? Again, you touched on, on foreign exchange where the dollar is. Very different fiscal path now in the UK post recent change in, in government. How how do you see sterling moving from this this point? Yes, of course, in our brainstormings, of course, sterling has been really volatile, just like guilt yields, by the way. And this is because of the political changes, the fiscal changes. A while ago, we had the view that sterling was going to approach parity versus the dollar. We got close to that, to 103, but then we got a good dose of old fashioned fiscal austerity or fiscal consolidation. And so this has led already who are recovered in sterling, we had a 120 versus the dollar or so, give or take. And we expect this uh, to be the level that we'll see for the next couple of quarters or so. But then eventually we should see when everyone stops raising interest rates and when the UK comes out, hopefully, out of recession in the final part of next year, maybe the final bit um, going into 2024, more towards 125 or so. I, I would suggest essentially a moderate sterling recovery and a delayed one uh, from from current levels sterling strengths in just a little bit okay. uh, another question Pro probably still to you dan daniele uh, so a lot of what you have said makes perfect sense but where do you see the most underappreciated opportunities 
and risks, where are we most different from, from consensus as you see it reading across other houses? OK, this is an, an interesting one. It's an important one as well. Maybe just maybe allow me just to say that uh, to proceed the, sort of the answer that we are trying not to do the same thing everywhere in the portfolio. We try to have a diversified exposure to a range of, of trends and topics. Of course, we have a base case we have a baseline scenario, but we also try to diversify to capture some of those upside or downside risks. So I think one area where we differ from the consensus is that we, we believe the Eurozone is under more pressure than the market expects and appreciates. Within the recession is going to be more pronounced. It doesn't need to be deep per se necessarily, but more pronounced than the consensus expectation. We think earnings projections are too optimistic. They haven't adjusted in the in the Euro area. And so that's why uh, I think we have a reduced exposure to Eurozone equities. That's why we prefer other markets. That's one. And another way we, we approach investing is that sometimes we take directional calls. So we have a baseline, a house view, a narrative, and we invest according to that. But other times we also look for asset classes and markets that have already adjusted. For example, something that didn't work this year, emerging market equities, they've been under significant pressure because of the China lockdowns, because of the real estate correction in China. Now, emerging market equities look attractively valued. I'll just give you an example. You take Brazil. If you look at Brazil, interest rates now are close to 15%. In the UK are 3%. If you look at inflation in Brazil is 8%. In the UK is 11%. Of course, I'm stretching the argument. One is emerging market, another is a developed market. But what I'm saying is that emerging market equities have already adjusted. And this is why I think this is a market that could do well in 2023. Bidden this year, but but it could do well. So that's maybe that's another area where we differ somewhat from the consensus. Thank you. Um, I, I mentioned in my introductory comments that the clients of ours, uh, let's talk about our clients, have have lost some significant values in, in capital terms um, over the last year or so. Sarik, question in from from one of our um, participants. Having lost money in my portfolio, and from what I'm hearing, the plan perhaps means that only new investors will, will profit from the, the the direction that we are we are taking and some of the changes that are are within portfolios. If you've been invested with us and have lost some money in in paper real terms in the last twelve months, does our positioning kind of mean that's lost forever? Is there no way back for those those clients? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good question, and it's a question we get we get quite a lot. It's linked with the question, you know, recoveries after your portfolio values have fallen. I think there's an important point, which is you haven't lost anything until you've sold everything and gone to cash. OK, which historically is the biggest mistake to make. So unless you need that cash for a purchase of property or something in the short term, you know, the key thing is to stay patient, stay invested. Volatility and uncertainty in markets happens quite a lot. I mean, if we take bond markets, yes, this has been extreme this year, almost one of the worst years for bonds in 150 years. But for equities, it's not unusual to have falls of 20%, 15, 20%. I think it's happened about eight times in the last 20 years to have at least 15% drops during a year. Uh, this year has been a bit more abnormal because we've gone from 0% interest rates to 4% interest rates in, in basically less than 12 months. Mm. There is an upshot to that, which is the expected returns going forward are higher. And what does that mean? That also means that recovery potential from a lower base in equity markets and also a higher level of interest rates and bond yields means that your future returns should be higher, all things being equal. So all things being equal is important. Do we think the economy is, do we think the cycle is broken? The answer to that is no. And maybe Daniele can expand on that later, but you know, from a consumer standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, we're not seeing the imbalances that have been associated with effectively major recessions, major depressions historically. We're not seeing that this time around. And I touched on some of the innovations that are happening in the background, which some of us are not seeing in our daily lives yet, but they are happening. Uh, 
they are happening for the reason that I touched on earlier. They, they are there, they're underpinning the economies. They are positive drivers for productivity growth, for growth in the long run and profit growth for companies. This is positive. This is happening in the background. This will not stop in the next 10 to 20 years. So with this in mind, what does that mean? Well, portfolios have genuine recovery potential. Expected returns are way higher than they were, say, 12 months ago before we went through the last 12 months. So you could recover your portfolio, the kind of falls we've seen this year, which in some cases have been between 10 and 15 percent across portfolios. This can come back quite quickly. History shows, actually, once the market is able to look past the near term uncertainty, then it moves to discounting, to anticipating the future, a future which in the long run, three, five, ten years, still, still remains quite bright because of this fundamental trends I've touched on. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor for, for how we think about recovery potential. You can also just apply a very simple historic look at what happened after 2008 and what happened after 2000 after those kind of major falls in markets. Markets recovered actually quite quickly within a couple of years. Yeah, understood. And uh, again, as I said in my introduction, while, while we can, by nature of this call, only answer in a, a very general way. We do stand ready to to help you understand what it means to you, your time horizon, capital requirements. So so please do reach out to your your client advisor and let, let's kind of uh, help you understand and make sense of that in a little bit more more detail. Time time is is kind of running against us, chaps. But there's what one kind of or two parts to an important question here. One, I think, for uh, you, Daniele, and then so that you your view. So we've set out a base case here but what catalysts will we continue to to monitor and have a sense of whether that base case is actually happening and and therefore be able to 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 change that that macro view Daniele and if that is the case uh, so that how do we balance our long-term conviction views whilst pivoting to to kind of take advantage of of or, or being proactive when market conditions change. So if I can come quickly to Daniele, conscious of time, and then Sirik on the portfolio, and then we'll, we'll wrap up from there. OK, sure. A lot to cover, but I'll try to answer concisely. So um, our baseline is, is a scenario where we look for three shifts, we said, right? We look for the past the peak in inflation. We look also for the stabilization in interest rates. And we look for a rebound in China growth that keeps the world economy out of global recession while the West in the first part of the year is in recession. Now, to the upside, if inflation were to roll over to decline more sharply, again, we don't think it's, it's a plausible base case, but should that happen, this is likely to boost the parts of the market that have been under pressure this year. US equities, US stocks, as an example. So we're looking for that type of action all else being equal. Of course, conversely, if interest rates continue to rise because central banks are not comfortable that inflation is slowing enough, even if it moderates or slowing quickly enough, that spike in interest rates would suggest to, uh, to us that we may see a similar dynamic to what we've seen this year. Equity prices fall, but bond prices, contrary to our expectation, fall as well. In that case, we will need to de risk. We'll be looking for diversifiers such as gold. And finally, look, we made some geopolitical assumptions. And let me stress these are assumptions. If the war in Ukraine was to end today, one would probably look at European assets. We assume that China and Taiwan doesn't deteriorate. Should it deteriorate, well, we'll need to de risk emerging market exposures. So hopefully this gives you a sense of how we think there's many more catalysts. Again, there's a baseline, baseline and we try to connect catalysts with what we might do all else being equal in portfolios. Great, thank you. And Sadiq from a portfolio construction lens. Yes, so I think the importance from a portfolio construction uh, standpoint is to, to not just be exposed to your base case view. So you want to own a blend of assets. That's what we mean by diversification blend of assets that have different characteristics that can perform in different scenarios potentially in the ones where maybe they will do okay in the ones when we write but if we're not right they would do quite well and they would add something different so we try and do this uh, more via some of our exposures we touched on some of the factor exposures uh, we've we've looked at some of the changes made on, on the fixed income front and you know we always stand ready to make improvements i think it's important it's not because we 
we're presenting here today an, an outlook that this is our view for the next 12 months and it won't change. If we have, thanks to our research process, a view that actually we can improve portfolio outcomes by making changes in January or in February, if the market gives us an opportunity to exploit uh, the kind of near term, then we will make changes. So I think the important thing is not staying static. Uh, hopefully we're showing you uh, we are bringing in some new levers, new ways to uh, exploit some of the near-term opportunities. And, and at the same time, we also always make sure we're comfortable with our long-term pillars. You know, we've got long-term views that I've expressed on some of these drivers. These, these obviously we don't expect to change, but we also review that they're fit for purpose, you know, for the long term. And the important thing is not to be still, sit in your chair and just wait for the market to come to you. We also want to be proactive on all these fronts. Understood. Thank you. So, folks, we're, we're a little bit over time. Thank you for for joining us. Um, I think I hope I've, I've kind of matched the bucket and, and cover most of your your questions, at, at least to some extent. We will take some time over the days ahead to review the questions that have come in. And if there's any anything that we don't feel we've, we have covered, we'll circulate um, th those answers to you along, along with a, a recording of today's session. So thank you for joining us uh, from Danielli, from Sarik and from me. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you for your questions. I hope you all have a lovely weekend. I hope you have a wonderful festive holiday season and a prosperous 2023. And we we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.